morning scripture is Acts 1, 6 through 11. You can find this scripture in your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along. It's in the New Testament on page 118. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up, taken up from you, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Shall I pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much today. A couple of days ago, temperature was 85 degrees, and yesterday, today, was 15, 23 Weather changes, but you never change. You love us all the time, forever. Please bring the same Holy Spirit you pour upon the disciples 2,000 years ago today, so we will see you, feel you, and listen to your voice. In your name we pray. Amen. Today's uh, sermon title is, This is it. You know, I had a hard time to understand this simple phrase 20 years ago. You know, 20 years ago, when I came to this country, I translated everything, every English word and phrase. You don't look like I, I'm, I'm translating, but actually in my brain, I'm talking about 20 years ago, I translated everything in Korean. But there are a couple of English phrases that I cannot translate, this is it, is one of them. The first time that I heard this phrase was in college. I turned in my final paper, then my professor said, this is it, Jay. You are officially done with your class in this country, and first class in this class. This is it. I didn't know what he meant at the time when he said this is it. The second time that I heard was a graduation ceremony. And the commencement speaker, I don't recall who he was, he said, hey, this is it. You have lived in a fantasy world. Now I'm going to tell you what's out there. So this is it. This phrase has many different meanings depending on uh, what circumstances you use it for. It could mean, you know, it's the way that it's supposed to happen. You do it because you have to do it, or you have no choice. What it means depends on what circumstance you may be in and what, when you use the phrase. A couple of months ago, I bought a toy called Bay, Beyblade Blast. Have you seen the toy? Beyblade, Beyblade Blast. It's a small toy. It's like a spinning, spinning top. It's made out of plastic or metal. You put a uh, plastic string into it and put it out as fast as you can. Then it spins around in a small you know, ball. It's very expensive. I don't understand why kids' toys are very expensive nowadays. Small one is $7 to $30. So about one for Jaden, that he was so excited. Oh, Dad, this is you know, what I always wanted. Then he tried to open it. Then he broke it. <laughs> so I was talking to him on Skype. He looked at me. Dad. It means what? Buy me one more. <laughs> I said, 
This is it. <laughs> no more toy. Too expensive. So this is it has a many different meanings. So I can use the phrase to describe chapter 1 in book of Acts uh, chapter 1 and 6. After rising from the dead, Jesus shows his body to the disciples and they have eyewitnessed his resurrection and they see him and talk to him and communicate with him. They got new responsibility, they got new mission. And also Jesus' mission on earth has been accomplished in a way that it should happen. And his redemptive uh, uh, his uh, covenant, his redemptive salvation for humanity has been done successfully. So here, everything seems to be perfect, you know, flawless and accurate. So I would say, this is it. This is what God has planned it for humanity 2,000 years ago. It happened exactly what it was supposed to happen. Everyone should be excited. But unfortunately, it's not the case of the disciples. They still don't know what's going on. They still don't understand the purpose of Jesus' death and resurrection. Now here in this chapter, Jesus, uh, the disciples ask Jesus, this is the time that you restore the kingdom on earth? You know, in, throughout the whole Jesus' ministry, Jesus mentioned a few times for sure. I guess Jesus mentioned many, many times to his disciples that how he's going to die and raise from the dead. He mentioned many times that my kingdom doesn't belong to this earth. You know, Matthew chapter 20, verse, verse 20, mother of uh, James and John asked Jesus, Hey Lord, when you have your kingdom on earth, please have my sons on one right side, on the left side. And Jesus says, Hey, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, it's pretty embarrassing actually. If you ask me something that doesn't make sense, I would say, Hey, I'm sorry, you know, you ask me something's not right. But Jesus says, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. My kingdom doesn't belong to this earth. John 18, Jesus clearly mentioned that my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom belongs to this world, then my servant, my disciples would fight to prevent me from being arrested. So Jesus clearly mentions that my kingdom belongs to heaven. My kingdom is not on earth. But the, the, but the disciples still don't understand that they're going to see God's kingdom on earth. So he asked, they asked Jesus, is this the time that you restore your kingdom on earth? Jesus says, no, it's not time. It's not the time. But I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. You're going to be my witness. The Holy Spirit, they don't even know what it is. They don't even know when it's coming and how it's coming. What they ask, they want to see clear vision and sign on earth. But instead of giving them the answer what they expect to hear, Jesus says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. They might have thought, what is this Holy Spirit? You know, what it is, how it's come. So all disciples, they were gazing up toward the sky when our Lord is ascending to heaven. When you look at this verse, you might think, oh, they, you know, look at Jesus, you know, raise their hand. And praise the Lord. Glory, glory. You know, my, my Lord is going back to his place.
place in the heaven. It's not. Scripture, any place in the Bible doesn't mention that the disciples praise the Lord, glorify the Lord when they see that Jesus is ascending. You know, Luke chapter 24, verse 56, I think verse 56, after Jesus ascended into heaven, then disciples came back to Jerusalem, then they praised the Lord with joy. But at the moment when Jesus was, is rising into, the, into heaven, they were just standing there. They were gazing upon, the, upon Jesus rising to the sky. Their look is some sort of dumbfound look. They don't know what to do. It's not the things that we expect to hear. It's like your loved one is leaving for another country. Your loved one is going to be gone for a long time and you don't know when you're going to see the person and how you're going to see the person. In the Greek language, gaze upon is like you looking something hopelessly. So disciples are standing there looking at Jesus hopelessly. What am I going to do? What are we going to do? We ask him to restore the kingdom on earth. Instead, he just living. He's living for good. Now, back in 1995, uh, my mother brought me this country for college. And in about, I think, three weeks, and she had to go back to her country. <clears throat> so you know, we went to the airport. You know, do you remember that back in those days, you could go all the way up to the flight gate to see the airplane fly up? So me and uh, my friends, uh, my mom's friend, <clears throat> went to the airport, and she, you know, she's flying up, and I gazed upon her airplane flying up at the time. I was 16. I was thinking, I didn't know the phrase, this is it. If I knew, I was going to say, hey, this is it. You know, I'm all by myself. I have to do everything by myself. I'm alone. But when I look at the airplane, I still remember that. Wow, I'm really alone. What am I going to do here in this country? That gaze upon toward the sky. That's exactly disciples looking at the sky. Wow, this is it. What are we going to do? Jesus was raised from the dead. I'm sure they must feel excited. Hey, this is the time. You know, they thought that Jesus was going to gather all the disciples together and avenge those who persecute us. I'm going to be an avenger. You know, it's time to you know, take back. It's time to restore God's kingdom on earth. But instead, Jesus is leaving and say, hey, goodbye. But I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit soon. <laughs> when? When the Holy Spirit is coming down. You know, when you look at Acts chapter 1, we really carefully look at what the disciples would have felt at the time. Here Jesus, risen Jesus, he is going up to heaven. Now here are the disciples. They just don't found. They don't know what to do. It's kind of ironic to see that at the most important moment of divine ascension, the disciples still are not sure of what's going on here. They are not sure of what they're going to do. The region Christ and the disciples and Jesus gave them a new mission. New responsibility. Jesus gave them the, the greatest command. You should go out into the world, make all people disciples. It doesn't fit. The perfect Christ. But the disciples who are confused, who are insecure. I mean, God's perfect mission 
supposed to be carried out by those who are able, those who are intelligent, those who are knowledgeable, those who are confident, not by those who are coward, those who are insecure. But the, here, the disciples, they don't know what to do with the command, the greatest command. Why did God give his greatest command to those who are still not sure? At this moment, the history moment of Jesus' ascension, it just doesn't fit. You know, God's will and his plans are very mysterious that we never understand. God always chooses the poorest and weakest to make the rich and the strong humble. That's what God does. God planned his kingdom on earth by using those who we don't expect. God always chooses an impossible of people to make things possible. That's what God does in this chapter. Disciples were standing there, gazing upon the sky, and Jesus is leaving, but the Holy Spirit is coming to them 10 days later. So the time that Jesus ascended to heaven, for 10 days, the disciples didn't even have the Holy Spirit. That's the most obscure time. That's the most uh, uncertain time that the disciples didn't really have any direction. You know, 10 days is a long period of time if you don't know what to do. If you don't know when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen, 10 days is a long period of time. But the actual one, that's what it is. Jesus tried to teach them, my body is going to be invisible. My body is going to be gone, but you can talk to me, you can see me, you can be a witness through the Spirit. That's the point of Acts chapter 1. I'm going to give you my Spirit, you're going to be my witness to the world through the Spirit. God speaks to us through the Spirit. We seize Him through the Spirit. We listen to Him through the Spirit. This is the way that we communicate with the Lord. This is the way that we feel His presence. This is the way that we hear the Lord. There is no sign. There is no symbol. There is no visible miracle anymore. The Holy Spirit is the only way that we can see the Lord. The name of Christ, the only name that can save us. You know, many Christians are attracted to sort of voodoo theology. Voodoo theology means you try to see a sign and symbol. They are attracted to a voodoo theology because they want to see, they want to be sure that this is the Lord. They want to see that a hey, God tells me what I need to do. That's Buddha theology. I have a friend of mine, he told me, Jay, I had a job offer in Kentucky, but I didn't know if I want, wanted to go there or not. But one day my son told me, hey dad, I want to go eat Kentucky fried chicken. <laughs> Jay, that's the sign that God, you know, who sent me to Kentucky or Kentucky. If you live in this town, you never ever move to Kentucky. We have, we have no Kentucky fried chicken. You go to Walmart, buy a trash can, it's made, made in China. Yeah, God sent me to China as a missionary. I'm not kidding, I'm not making it up. This is true story. One of my friends, he, uh, he got a decent job. He's a car mechanic. Then one day, one of his friends called him that, hey, you know, I pray for you. Then God told me you would quit your job and sell your car and with the money help homeless people. That sounds, sounds great to helping those who are in need. But he is a single father. 
with two teenagers. If he sells the car, quit the job, how he's going to support his family? Holy Spirit is invisible, but it's not reckless. It's not irresponsible. Holy Spirit is real and reasonable. So we shouldn't follow the, whole, the Holy Spirit, which is something that beyond our human or reasonable uh, thing. Jesus Christ is not visible. His body is not visible, but he is here with us through the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to uh, pray every day. We have to read the scripture every day. Not because we're going to see a sign and symbol, but because when Jesus Christ comes to us, we have to make sure that this is Christ. This is the Lord. Sometimes we are misunderstood by the voice of Satan, voodoo theology, mystical religion. That's why I got told the ten brides, you have to, you have to uh, be awake every hour, every moment, but we don't know when Jesus is coming. Jesus Christ, Jesus is coming doesn't depend on how we feel today. Jesus is coming doesn't depend on we are ready or not. He's coming because he wants to come. That's what Jesus told his disciples, you do not know the time that is set by the God's authority. He's coming totally depends when he is coming. God is going to answer our prayer totally depends. He set the time. God make our prayer request happen because he is going to make our prayer request happen. It totally depends on his authority. Twelve disciples want to be sure of time that when he is coming, but Jesus says, no, you don't need to know. But I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, you can see when I talk to you, when I reach out to you, through the Spirit, you're going to be my witness. The greatest gift given to humanity is the Holy Spirit. But we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is not visible. If you try to be, be sure to see God's presence and God's sign every single moment that you pray, that's Buddha theology. You might say, God, if you show me clearly what I need to do tonight in my dream, you lie to yourself. You're not going to believe. You might have to wait for a long, long time. Because the Holy Spirit is invisible, but it only speaks to us when you truly get close to, the Lord, close to the Lord, when you pray with the scripture and your spirituality is awakened to receive the God's voice and his presence. You know, we follow Christ all of our lives, but sometimes we are very we are in a situation that is now really clear and obscure. But that's the way it is. That's the way the Holy Spirit works in my life. It's not clear. It seems, to, it seems that we are in darkness. I'm pretty sure the 12 disciples, other fellow Christ, might have felt the same way when they see Jesus ascending into heaven. They wanted to see clear vision. But God says, no, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. Talk to me through the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit here. God is with you. God is speaking to you. God is listening to you. That's why we always have to pray, kneel down, be sensitive to His Spirit. He speaks to us all the time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much today. And you are here with us. Your spirit is with us. You do something impossible that we could ever imagine. Father, thank you so much for your gift, which is the Holy Spirit given to us. 
Thank you so much for your uh, love and grace. We feel your grace and love through the Spirit, Lord. You are not visible, but you are here, Lord. We can see it and feel it. Help us always pray. Help us always read the scripture so we know when you come, it's you, it's your voice, it's your presence. In your name we pray. Amen.